Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to back. Welcome back to our women's uh, 1 p.m. afternoon Bible study. It's uh, the first one back for 2023. And it is good, right, and salutary that we start, start a new book of the Bible, which is Hebrews. And uh, Pastor Hensler is not here. I, I hope and pray that he will be here uh, next Monday. We'll have to wait and see. Even if he's not, we'll have Bible study and I'll carry on for him. Uh, but we will pray for him and for many other concerns and cares that are on our heart. And that is a great way for us to start. So let's bow our heads and turn to our Lord and Savior. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day and for all of these ladies that have come to be part of our Bible study today. Holy Spirit, join us. Help us to understand these truths from your word. Grant us not just understanding, but the weak application, that what we learn today would be applied to our hearts and minds and end up drawing us closer to you so we can be better witnesses of who you are to us, who our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is to us. We have these cares and concerns that are weighed heavy upon our hearts. We ask that you would lift them, Lord, so that we can better focus on what we need to do, knowing that you always hear and always respond in the most and best way. We lift up our brother, Pastor Hensler. We're thankful that uh, his surgery went uh, without complication. Make his recovery without complication, Lord. Bring him uh, to complete restoration of health. And while he is awaiting that, uh, keep him strong, body, soul, and spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with our sister Marlene and help her to find a dentist that works for her and takes her insurance. Uh, you are a God of all things and guide us in all things. Do this for her. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, I ask that you would be with me, that you would grant me healing for the problems I have in my life, especially for my toe. I pray that upcoming decisions and procedures would be your will and your means to, to grant me complete recovery. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with our uh, sister Karen as uh, she continues health and healing at home. Be with her as she uh, begins cancer treatment. Keep her body strong. Keep her mind strong. Uh, keep her spirit strong and faith towards you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with our uh, Jill's brother, Jack, uh, as he begins uh, this new cancer uh, replacement for cancer treatment. May his health be maintained, Lord, and may this work to keep him healthy and keep him alive. You are the God of life and you can do this. We trust in you. Be with Jill and grant her strength during this time. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with our sister Ruth as she continues uh, chemo treatment. Keep her and support her body, soul, and spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with Larry as his health deteriorates from cancer. Grant him a relaxing and peaceful time while he, was in, he is in Florida with his girlfriend. Uh, keep him safe. And Lord, you can heal any and all things. So we ask that you would intercede with healing in his life as well. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, we're thankful for the big things and the small things. We thank you for the sunshine that is today. We thank you for this building, this place. And I thank you for these women and their faith and their love that they share with one another and with me. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for caregivers, both those that do this as a profession and also privately and for our family members that have been care to caregivers for us. Encourage them and strengthen them in this because in doing so, they truly share the love of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, we give thanks to you uh, for, for your gift of police protection. Uh, we thank you for the Metro Police that guard our uh, area here. We thank you for the Genesee County Sheriff's Department, for the State Police and the National Guard. Continue to use those to protect and serve be with these men. May they be fair and impartial in all things. Protect them. Put a bubble of protection around them uh, so that they may return home to their families after each and every shift. And as we get opportunity, Lord, both as a church and as individuals, may we share thanks for them, heartfelt thanks. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Be with all those in Ukraine, Lord, that are struggling through the war. We ask that you would bring an end to it. And while they're struggling, Lord, support all those that are homeless, that are without power and are within need. Be with those agencies that are stepping in to help them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with Annette uh, as uh, she struggles to care for her mom who has dementia. And as there's been family complications with people that are there, and struggles with personalities. Uh, Lord, you are a uh, healing and a reconciling God. 
bring reconciliation in that family and may all be done for mom's health and well-being. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord, be with Zane. Uh, grant him uh, uh, a, a, a healing uh, from the sensitivity he has to light. Help the doctors to find out what the problem is and to be able to cure it. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And Lord God, be with Mackenzie as she struggles to pass her bar exam. We ask that you would help her to do her very best and to exhibit the learning that she has uh, accomplished in the past and grant her a good wage and may she turn and give you glory and thanks for all of it. Lord, in your mercy. We turn now, Lord, to your word, asking that you would be with us and guide us as we study. And all God's people respond. Amen. All right, the book of Hebrews, which is not instruction on how to make coffee. Well, <laughs> you thought it was. Right, the book of Hebrews, or is that there's a man ruling coffee? A number of communications. We should, uh, we should start the recording. No, we did start recording. Yes, we should start what? We did. Okay, good. Uh, Marlene had a great question, and I figured this is kind of how we'd start. I would just ask you, what do you know about the book? So Marlene asked, did one person write it? Uh, I believe we do believe one person wrote it because the style of Greek that is written and is pretty consistent through the whole thing. Uh, the question is who? And we don't really know. There's no author attributed in the text. Uh, there's been various authors that have been put forth throughout church history. One is Paul. There's certainly some arguments, and Paul always was good on looking back to the Old Testament and to the Jewish uh, and Israeli faith in Yahweh that Moses gave them, and how that pertains to Christ today. And there's plenty of that in Hebrew. But the, as I understand, the style of writing is not exactly Paul's. Uh, some of the other apostles have been put forth, but once again, style's not there. Uh, one I think that Luther liked was Apollos. Remember Apollos? He was supposed to be a very learned man. Uh, Paul had to come along and kind of fill him in on some things that he didn't have. Uh, but, as, but whoever wrote this is very learned in both uh, uh, the Hebrew uh, worship beliefs, but also in Christ. He knows a lot about how those pertain to Christ. He's a possibility. Barnabas is another one. Uh, remember, Barnabas was one of Paul's uh, sidekicks in the beginning. But we really don't know. Uh, what our study here in the introduction is going to tell you more than likely, whoever wrote the book kept his name, kept it anonymous for fear of persecution. Because we're heading into the time in, in Rome where the church was being persecuted. Any other questions? What else do you know about Hebrews or what other questions do you have on the book? Have you ever read any of it? I mean, you've, no. you've encountered, you have encountered it in worship. It does come up in our lectionary. It's... Uh, our epistle readings. The chapter of faith. Yeah, very good. The hall of faith, where it lists all of those Old Testament figures that exhibited faith. Yeah. So once again, you see that the author knew something about, it. and and that is that is very inspiring too. And as you look at each one of these people, like uh, Abraham, David, Noah, they're all human. I mean, none of them were perfect. But over and above their failures, they exhibited faith in a God who not only protects, but forgives. Anything else comes to mind with Hebrews? A lot of the Old Testament references. A ton of Old Testament references, yes. Well, it sounds like he was revered. I mean, according to this first part of Hebrews, he was very important. I don't know. To me, came across as kind of revered. He's he's writing to uh, Jewish Christians who are suffering, uh, that are beginning to have persecution, and one of the ways that they're being tempted is to return back to their old ways, to looking for salvation within uh, the uh, Jewish means. In other words, law keeping and. Uh, uh, putting their faith in um, keeping kosher and in uh, uh, circumcision instead of putting their faith in Christ. And so one of the things this author is doing is going back to say, yes, those things were important, 
but they all find a greater fulfillment in Christ. Don't trust those things. Put your trust in Christ because he is the fulfillment of all of it. It all pointed to him. Hence all of the Old Testament references. Anything else? Is it kind of a proof, showing a proof that the Old Testament promise was Jesus? Yeah. And, and why it is important. There, there are plenty, not Lutheran churches, but plenty of other denominations that kind of look at the Old Testament as a closed book. We don't need to look at it anymore. That was the Old Testament, the old way. Now God has developed this new way. Well, it's not really new. It's a fulfillment of the old. If you don't have the old, you're lacking so much the importance of the new and how it's the same God that was working then, working throughout history and finding the fulfillment now. And in that, when you realize that, you have great trust and, and faith in this God that has continued to work. He never makes a mistake. He never stopped and said, oh, well, that's not working. Let's do something new. That's not our God. Despite that's how we work, we give up on things. And, and these, these Israelites or these Jews were wanting to give up on God. He never gave up on them. I, I can remember uh, the first time that uh, I was told by a pastor that, you know, the uh, <clears throat> coming of Christ was in Genesis. And I mean, I was... I was just really, you know, there's just so much to, to, to know and to hear and, and learn. But when you can when you can go back into the Old Testament and see, and I've had that happen several times when we've went back and read something that's in the New Testament that was foreseen in the Old Testament. Wow, that's... I don't know. That makes me excited. <laughs> Should. You know? Hebrews 1 kind of works in conjunction with John, chapter 1, John's gospel. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Christ is going to be, creation is going to be attributed to him. So, yeah, from the very first, when you have let there be, that's Christ. That's the Son of God. He is the Word of God made flesh. He working in conjunction with the Father and the Holy Spirit, spoke everything into existence. We, we in, of course, you don't have in chapter Genesis chapter 3, you don't have the person of the Trinity listed. We know that Lord, capital L-O-R-D, and that's really the, the uh, Jewish word Yahweh, uh, uh, not communicated, but translated. That's, that's all three of them. When you have one, you have all three. And well, we don't have this as an exact answer, I can tell you this from my own opinion. The second member of the Trinity is the one that makes appearances to people. So who was it that came and appeared in the garden and spoke to Adam and Eve? The member of the Trinity that makes himself known in some way, shape, or form as the word, be it embodied or not, that's Jesus. So who came and gave that promise to Eve? that one would come, the very one that would fulfill that in Mary. Isn't that wild when you think about it? How did he know? Because he was going to do it and knew exactly how he was going to do it and knew how he was going to reveal it throughout all the promises of the Old Testament and make it happen at just the right time with this woman in this city at this time. Quite a God we have, isn't it? He's an awesome God. Anything else about Hebrews? Any, and especially anything that you want to know about, any questions that you want to make sure you have answered. And you may not really have any because once again, we do have some, uh, we do read from it occasionally in, in worship, but it's not something I think you've probably ever sat down and read all the way through from beginning to end. You have? Well, you'll get a star on your forehead after we're all done. <laughs> I was in a Hebrew study. Okay. Good. Hopefully, hopefully you can. Hopefully you can help us along with this. So. <laughs> I think I need to refresh. refresh. <laughs> it, it is. It is kind of a hard book because it deals with things that. Uh, well, the well, the writer of Hebrews does give us a lot of information. We're not Jews. 
and, and we didn't we didn't celebrate all of those things and, and follow all of the things they did. So it's hard. It's hard to read, but it's not impossible. And so we have to understand, first of all, what they did, how God directed them to worship and to conduct their life in ways that foreshadow Christ. So when Christ came, they would say, ah, well, we're in the right season, right? They would have an epiphany. <laughs> we have to understand what they did, and then we can get that whole epiphany moment through what is written in Scripture. Okay. Why don't we start, uh, and we'll start with the introduction, and I have somebody that would be willing to read. You can read all the way down to the part where it says leader's notes, and we can stop that, get stopped there. But just that first page, beginning with welcome to a study. And uh, I can actually, would be good right and salutary for me to put that on the screen. Okay. Welcome to a study of one of the most profound books of the New Testament. If you are looking for a model to follow, a cause with which to identify, you'll find it here. If you are looking for some serious study for solid food instead of baby food, you'll enjoy this study. This first century letter to the Hebrew Christians is heavy on theology and is filled with all kinds of practical applications for Christian life in this century. But above all, it points us to the fulfillment of faith, Jesus Christ, the one who saves us and empowers us to live the new life. Many Jewish Christians of the first century had been made homeless because of their faith. They lived as pilgrims and strangers in a world that was often hostile to them. They were mocked, tormented, persecuted, and imprisoned. Seeking refuge, many lived in caves. Christians just didn't fit into the Roman style of life. As aliens, they needed encouragement to live for Christ in spite of their circumstances. So the writer of this letter urged them to endure. The necessary courage would come through Jesus Christ, who is first and last and remains forever. Through Jesus, we too are made capable of enduring and overcoming all the struggles of life. <laughs> God moved the author of Hebrews to use rich style and language as he penned this treatise. He quoted the Old Testament 29 times and alluded to it more than 50 times as he revealed to us the one person who fulfilled every prophecy, Jesus Christ. Only God knows who wrote this letter, possibly desiring to remain anonymous for fear of persecution, the writer intentionally veiled his identity. Scholars have suggested Paul, Apollos, Luke, Barnabas, Priscilla, and Clement of Rome as possible authors. Whoever it was, the author saw the need to build up the Christians under persecution and to encourage them to live to the glory of Jesus. You will find a challenging message in this book. As you study it, you can be sure that God will build up your faith. Thank you, Norma. With that little introduction, why don't we turn and read the first chapter of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter one. We'll read it all the way through and let the study guide go through and help us to pick it apart and gain a better understanding. Of it all. I have a question. Sure. Um, is Priscilla a man or a woman? Woman. Because did we have any? Oh, no, wait a minute. Um, was it Priscilla was it was it and Aquila. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Priscilla was a woman. She was involved she, in tech, tech, yeah, tech she, making she, and that kind of thing. Very faithful. But, but did any women write any of the books in the Bible? She would be the only one that I know of, if this was indeed her right. Oh. But we don't have any, any proof that it was. I couldn't tell you why they put her name forward, other than that she was a very faithful woman, and she hung with Paul and did a lot of ministry work. 
I was just, I, I just thought, hmm, I don't think yeah. I ever heard that. Mm -hmm. This is the first study I've ever heard her name put forward as well. So, so. That's, yeah, I've read about it though, somewhere. Okay, uh, any other questions? Volunteer to read as far as you can through Hebrews 1. And when you get tired, we can always pass it off to somebody else. Okay. You know, as we get started, let me read these first two things and then I'll have you read it and we'll continue on. So our theme verse is in these last days, God has spoken to us by his son through whom he has made the universe. That's the second verse of uh, Hebrews 1. Our goal through the study of the first chapter of Hebrews, we pray that the Holy Spirit may help us to identify Jesus as God, the only Son, the one who was promised and who appeared on earth to show us the Father, recognize that when we see Jesus, we see the Father, and find special help and comfort in seeing Jesus as the Lord of our life. With that, Hebrews 1. Whoever wants to give it a crack and get started, go right ahead. Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son? And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Stop for a moment. Who's the firstborn that he brought into the world? Christ. Jesus. What do we see happening right at his birth? Who's the first creatures to give him praise and worship? The angels. Amen. Angels who we have heard on high. All right. Great. You keep going. He makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness behind your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of of the earth in the beginning and the heavens are the work of your hands they will perish but you remain they will all wear out like a garment like a robe you will you will roll them up like a garment they will be changed but you are the same and your years will have no end and to which of the angels has he ever said sit at my right hand until i make your enemies a footstool for your feet they are not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. Are they not? So this first chapter has a couple different points that it's pushing. Right off the bat, it's pointing to Christ as what in general? God. 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 Inherit God. He really and truly is God. And then what is the comparison made between God? This is God, but who is not God? Angels. The angels. Angels. And he's not an angel. He is God. Yeah. And uh, perhaps in the study, if we have time today, if not next week, we'll talk a little bit about how there's important things to use here if you talk to Jehovah Witnesses. They do interpret this and use this for their own means to support, but they have to actually change the Greek to use it. Because it clearly, as it's been translated here, tells you he's not an angel. The Jehovah Witnesses believe he is like an angelic being. The firstborn created creature, higher than any of the angels, but a true creature, not divine, received divinity, but didn't exist beforehand in eternity past. Uh, that's what Jehovah Witnesses believe about Jesus. They don't believe he's, he's completely divine. So in our creed, we have begotten, not made. Yeah. Pretty much says it, doesn't it? So the Jehovah Witnesses say that creed? No, they can't. Not in mean it. 
Yeah, and, and this this also shows you that it's a very Jewish oriented kind of thing. And I, I'm surprised in the introduction they don't point to that. The Jews really highly respected angels, almost to the point where they worshiped them. They really loved stories about the angels coming and doing things. And because they had a history of that in the past, angels had done some glorious things for uh, Israelites and for the Jews. As much as they lifted them up, this writer is saying, no, there's something greater there. Angels serve this greater one who is Christ. So let's turn back to our study here. <laughs> And we'll read the what's going on section, which is always a good thing to focus on. Christ is superior in every way. All 13 chapters of this letter speak to this one issue. Throughout the centuries, God used the prophets to speak whenever he had a message to deliver. People looked upon the prophets with awe and often with fear. Sometimes, as God made their voices boxes, voice boxes, divine means of communicating truth, the prophets became downright unpopular. Yet Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, these men spoke by the Holy Spirit. He empowered them to speak the truth without error. The word they spoke touched the hearts of people, and it still does. At the close of the New Testament era, the message of God to his people was complete. God had spoken it a last time. Christ is the end of the message, the exclamation part. He is God's last word to the world. Maybe people had revered the prophets. Now they were to focus on the Son of God and listen as they never had listened before. In Christ, God gave us his ultimate message. Words of salvation come from our majestic Lord, who has supremacy over all things in heaven, in this first chapter, God does not speak primarily of prophets or of angels, but of Jesus. As important, as powerful as prophets and angels are, the Son of God is superior to all of them. Therefore, he is the help, the aid, the comfort God has provided for everyone. He can help anyone. He even helps those who think they are beyond help. So don't run from it. Don't defect. Focus on the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is superior to every being in the universe. You can count on him. Cling to him by the faith he has given you. All right, let's start the next part, which is searching the scriptures. And we're asked to look at verses 2 through 3. So uh, let me put that back on the screen. And if somebody would care to read, Hebrews 1, read, read for me verses 2 to 3. Okay. Hebrews chapter one. Oh, verse two. Oh, three. <laughs> if, I can, if I confused you, if I, can, if I confused you, I'm sorry. You can even start with one. Read one through three. Well, she started. <laughs> Larry Bowen Curly. <laughs> Glad you said it. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, verse two. You can start at one. Read <laughs> use it more. Oh, Hebrews chapter one from the beginning. One, two, okay. And through through. Yes. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in, the, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he anoint, anoint, appointed heir to all things and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word, after he had provided <coughs> purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty, majesty in heaven. Good. Question one, in verses two to three, we have a fascinating introduction to God's son. 
gleaned from these verses the seven statements that speak so magnificently, magnificently about Jesus. So starting with verse two, what are some of the magnificent things that are proclaimed and lauded about Jesus? His son, an heir of all things. Mm -hmm. He was appointed the heir of all things. <laughs> appointed the heir of all things. He is the radiance. So appointed. The glory of God. Appointed. Does that mean that Jesus all of a sudden just decided that he was going to be no. these things? No. What does appointed mean? Somebody else said that you are. And who is that somebody else? God, God the Father. God the Father. Now, we're, we're speaking of Jesus. We have to keep in mind we're speaking of him not in just as his divinity, but as humanity. If he never became human, we'd just dealing with, be dealing with his divinity, and none of this would be necessary. But because of the fact that he's human, that has confused people. I mean, the Jehovah Witnesses, they, that, that her heresy has always been around. And so you even see the author of Hebrews, you know, in this, in this book, uh, fighting against that. Yeah, he's a human, but I'm here to tell you, he's far more than just a human. He's also divine in a way that is beyond our understanding. So we have a whole chapter here trying to explain exactly what that means. So yeah, appointed the heir of all things. Are we the heir of all things? No. Only through him. And once again, uh, this goes to the fact that uh, he, what have you said he was the son? It's going to, well, we'll get there. I'm going to leave that go. There's, leave that there. Yeah, we'll kind of, you know, he, he was heir of all things and through whom he made the universe, which kind of points to God because God created everything. Everything. Everything that you call reality was created through him. Not just the plants and the animals here on this earth, not just this earth. But the entire universe, the universe that we believe it goes on infinitum forever, is unending. He created it, and he is greater than it. You think about that. The universe has, you know, as far as we know, stretches out for infinity. That's pretty great. It's beyond something that I can understand. Yet he is greater than that and above that. So far so that he created it. If you're the creator, you're far greater than whatever was created, right? And he can see it. We can't see it. He can see it and know it. He can see it. He keeps in the deepest satellites and the highest. Well, he can. Yeah. He but can. we, he can at, the, at this point, our scientists, you know, are going deep into space, you know, and they're yeah. seeing all these beautiful things. And, and, I, and I have someone that's very into that and uh i don't share that so much with my so <laughs> because i already know who created that yeah and, and i'm not unamazed by how beautiful it is these pictures that are sent back and oh my gosh they're something well I just feel that's natural as a Christian to know that God has created that. Uh, they can go through and name all those stars and whatever <laughs> that they want. I've never been terrible, personally, never been terribly, you know, uh, in tune with that. Uh, not, not that I'm not in tune with it, I just I never really cared. <laughs> because I just always figured it, why is it so complicated <laughs> you, you bring up a good point about science though and I love what you said science is God's gift for us to discover the magnificence of his universe yeah. that's the only reason we can build these ships that can go out past our solar system and send back information it's because God wants us yes. to know and, allows us to. and I don't believe you're ever going to find life anywhere else i think what he wants us to know is how precious this one creation is out of all of that he did something very special very singular here and not just in creating this earth but you you are very special and you are very singular and you're the one he wants to have a relationship with i i think he wants us to be amazed at what he created 
because the more we are amazed at the creation, the more amazed and in love and in awe we are of the creator. creator. Yeah, I, I, when I look at it or something, I think, you know, I mean, I have to agree, it's beautiful, you know, and, and it's something, but it's not something that I'm, I'm surprised about. So does that mean scientists wouldn't be Christian? Many scientists aren't Christian. No, they're not. Um, God works through people that aren't Christian. Yeah. And he works through ones that are. Uh, the ones that aren't Christian, it's hard for them to truly be scientists because you're supposed to start with, uh, what do I understand? What are the facts? And from that, I draw a theory or conjecture. Right. The problem with non-Christian scientists is they start with a bias, which is there is no God, therefore. So if you're dealing with how all things came into being, well, there is no God, so there could be no six-day creation. Therefore, there's got to be some other answer, and it's got to be evolution in some way, shape, or form. But when you say that, you're not being a true scientist because you're going to ignore all of the proof that there's no way things could have evolved unless there was a creator. The, the proof of creation is out there, far greater than it is evolution. You just scientists don't want to admit that. Well, I've heard some of that. Have. There are creation, there are creation scientists. There's they, they believe there is a power or a person that started everything, but they're not necessarily Christian. They don't believe that that power is really personal, that it's a personal God. And that takes us into all kinds of new age kind of stuff. That's really where you get the idea of the force, <clears throat> Star Wars. It comes from that, where it's an impersonal thing, and there's a good part of it, and there's a bad part of it, and it's always existed, and it's just part of everything. Well, okay, fine. Where did that come from? <laughs> so, so really, you know, like uh, all these smart men like Freud and Einstein and all of those people that are so smart, they probably aren't Christian, right? Because they have to have everything has to be in its place. They have to be tangible. You have to be um, able to explain it. Right. The, the problem with a lot of philosophers is the places they look for answers are in here. Right. Yeah. In their own mind. And we know that our mind is broken and sinful. We can't know absolute truth on our own. It has to be revealed to us from outside. And our point of revelation, and this is what this chapter of Hebrews is going to tell you, is the one who reveals that is Christ through scripture. That's where you get truth from. But they look within themselves and in their heart and doing so they've closed themselves off to real truth. Once again, there is no God, therefore. And when you start with that premise, you're never going to get to truth. Good. So we talked about uh, through him, uh, all things were created, all that we call reality. Oh, one other thing. We often think about, and I was just talking about, the infinity going out, out into the universe away from us. But what about the infinity and complexity within? What makes up things? Well, there's atoms. And in atoms, there's neutrons and electrons and protons. And then there's things that make that up. And there's quarks. And scientists believe there's even more basic building blocks that are even deeper that we can't understand that are there. Infinity goes in that direction too. And God knows it. And he created it. He created it infinitely complex so that it all works. But in his love, he helps us to understand what we need to know to further glorify and praise him. That's mind-blowing too, isn't it? <laughs> what else do we have in these uh, verses here that uh, speaks so magnificently about Jesus? Is the radiance of the glory of God? Yeah, the radiance, the shining forth of God's glory. God's yes. glory is his divine power and majesty. Who he is is God. He's like no other. He's perfect. He's superior even to the angels. Superior. And so otherwise, I mean, but we know that God himself, God, as a triune God, is basically indiv invisible. God the Father is spirit. The Holy Spirit is spirit. But through Christ, through Jesus, we can actually see and know this invisible God. 
If not for Christ and for not the word of God, what would we know about God? We could look out in creation here and we could say, well, if somebody created all this, he must be pretty intelligent. <laughs> but it kind of looks like he created it all and left us to fend for ourselves. We wouldn't know him as a loving, caring God who loved us so much that he became one of us. That only comes through Christ as revealed through scripture. God's glory shining forth so we can see it and understand it. What else do we have in that verse? Purification for sin. How about right after the radiance, the exact imprint of his nature or the exact representation or the exact reproduction of his nature? His nature is beyond our understanding, but Christ is God become man so that we can. We can as fallible, finite, unable to understand everything human beings grasp this God that is beyond our understanding. He's it. Basically, if you think of John 1, 2, if you want to know how God feels about you, look at what Christ came and did. And this was Luther's greatest thing for you personally. He came and died and rose again for you out of love for you. That's who God is. The exact imprint of God's nature. In other words, the substance, what God really is, which once again is beyond our understanding, yet through Christ we can gain understanding in that. He shares that. That's what the Trinity shares, is that same exact God substance, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Always the same, always in agreement, always about the same thing. They never have to sit down and have a council meeting and get on the same page. They're always on the same page, and they all have the same love for you. Okay, what else do we have there? One of you said uh, after that in Prince of His Nature. Purificating. He upholds. In the universe by the word of his power. Yeah. So he's not a God that created everything and left us to fend for ourselves. The reason why this world is still spinning and we haven't all destroyed each other in nuclear war and why the earth hasn't smashed into the sun or the moon smashed into the earth or a comet hasn't destroyed us is why? He upholds us. He takes care of us. Him. It's Christ. He's doing that on behalf of the Father, by the Father's power and authority. Protecting us, making creation continue to work, despite all the ways we as human beings work against that and try to ruin it. <laughs> now, what's that? Well, I wonder how he's protecting us when we see these terrible things happening. Uh, I'm thinking of myself, I guess. But he has a divine plan. But it's hard to imagine. It's hard to understand. We, we think about how great he is and all these things we talk about that we don't understand that he does. And yet, as sinful human beings, we want to editorialize and comment about what he allows to happen. Are we really any place to do that? No. Why do bad things happen? Take your finger, point it at the person across from you. <laughs> do it. Point it at the person across from you. Now turn and bend it and point it back at yourself. <laughs> there it is. It's because you're a sinner and I'm a sinner and we're surrounded in a world of sinners and Adam and Eve allowed sin to enter creation and God had to curse creation and make it hard for us to live here so we would not worship creation but we would turn back and worship him to show us how much we need him every single day. He who created all things and sustains all things. In verse three, there's another thing we haven't talked about. After upholding the universe by his power, what does it say? After making purification for sins. Purification, cleansing. How did Jesus work to purify and cleanse us? Suffered and died. Rose again. And how did you receive that personally? Baptism. Baptism, the power of cleansing in your life. Now, finally, what do we have at the end of verse 3? Yeah. Who's the majesty on high? 
God the Father. God the Father sat down at the right hand. If you were a Jew, you would know that the right hand was the hand of power. Uh, kings often carried scepters. Scepters were examples of their rule. Uh, maybe because back in the day, you know, you could club somebody on the head that didn't agree with you or knock them out. But that's the ruling power. And where is Jesus sitting? The, right hand. Hand. the ruling power. In other words, God the Father has given him the power to rule over all things. Sitting down at the right hand of God is no place for any human being to be. First of all, if you were in the presence of a holy God, you would die. Sinful people cannot stand in the presence of a holy, sinless God. Unless he cloaks himself through means, as the Son of God did by becoming man. Cloaked himself in means so that he could actually live and breathe and work and serve for us sinful people. He's sitting at a place where no normal human being should be, but he can do that because why? He's not just a human. He's the divine son of God. And through his obedience as a man, he earned that right. Pretty cool stuff, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Any comments or questions on any of that? says at the bottom, notice that all of those statements speak also of God the Father. And why is that? Why, why can we attribute all of these things, both God the Father and God the Son? Because the Son is the exact, Jesus is the exact imprint of God's nature. And so all the things that we say of God are going to be applicable and true of the Son. Question number two. Knowing Christ is knowing God precisely as he is. What did Jesus say about himself and the Father in John 10? And it has verse 30, but we're going to turn to John 10, and I want to start with uh, verse 25. So keep your finger here in Hebrews. Let's turn to John chapter 10. This is Jesus speaking to the Jews, and it's good to know that in John's gospel, the Jews, he's not simply talking about those people of the tribe of Judah, the one tribe left of the Israelites. Jews for John are always those who question or oppose Jesus. So these are those that are either wondering about him or trying to prove that he's not the Messiah that he claims to be so they can kill him or at least get the people to stop following him. And so he's having this discussion with them. They're kind of asking him, okay, you tell us who you are. And he's like, I've already done that. I've done that in what I've said and what I've done. And so let's pick it up by John 10, read verses uh, 25 to 31. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not part of the flock. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Okay, right there. So the key verse there is verse 30. What does Jesus say? I and I the Father are one. I and the Father are one. Now, we could kind of claim that. I could say we're one as members of Lamb of God, or even we're one as believers in Christ. But he's going beyond this. He's saying, guess what? I am. And I am, by the way, is the English translation of Yahweh, I am that God. That is who I am. And you can, and the Jews know when they get it because what's their next thing they're going to do? Try to stone him. Pick up stones and stone him because he's blaspheming. He's claiming to be God. And any man that does that deserves death. I and the Father are one. One in a way that no one else is. 
And then we're also supposed to look at verse 38 of John 10. Let's read uh, uh, verses 37 to 38. So let's skip ahead a few verses in John 10, 37 to 38. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Another way for Jesus to emphasize that he and the Father are one. We do the same things. And I don't have to go meet with him and find out what they are because I and the Father are one. I know. I know exactly what the Father wants. And even more than that, I can do exactly what the Father wants. Something no other human being can do. Not perfectly. Not the way Jesus did. So he's making some bold claims here, and they all go back to what we have in Hebrews. Same substance, exact representation, just as God the Father is God, God the Son who became flesh, became Jesus Christ, is also God as well. Questions or comments on this? Well, it seems as though no matter what he says and what he does, we still don't believe. Great point, Marlene. I love that. I really do. Great point. Yeah, because you can read these things, and I can tell you these things, but there's something lacking. What's the only way you can have and hold these things as truth? Through faith. Yeah. Without faith, you cannot and will not believe. These Jews would not believe. Jesus was speaking to them, and in his very words, he was giving them that gift of faith in the Holy Spirit. And they were refusing it. You can't be the Messiah. You can't be who you say you are. It's not possible. It's beyond our understanding. And we refuse to believe. In Jewish thought, there was God and there was everything else. God and creation. Jesus is a person. He's part of creation. He can't be God. Well, guess what? Got to make an exception to that rule. He is. He's in the God box and he's in the creation box, and he's the only one they that fits still home. believe that way. The, the Orthodox, I had that term, and then the conservatives uh, are they conservative Jews, unless they're messianic Jews, do not believe he's God. They believe he's a man, they believe he's a prophet. Uh, probably they would say he was screwed up in some respects, or we got wrong what he was teaching. No, they don't believe he's God. To this day, do not believe. Good question. Any other questions? We're supposed to stay in the book of John now, but turn to chapter 14. Uh, John 14, verse 9. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? That's good. Just one of verse 9. Question 3 says, in John 14, 9, Jesus assured the disciples that when they had seen him, they had seen the Father. How do you see? Notice see is in quotation marks. How do you see God the Father in Jesus? By the works that he's done, the miracles he's performed, mm -hmm. by faith. By faith. By faith in what's presented to us. What's presented to us is his miracles. Mm -hmm. Throughout there, he's doing things that only God can do. He controls nature. He controls life and death. But not just that, you have to look at how he's teaching. Remember how many times Jesus says, truly I say to you. Any other rabbi, when he taught, was always quoting somebody else. This is what Moses said. This is what the prophet Elijah said. These are what rabbis before us that are great and exalted have said. Well, Jesus takes what Moses wrote, like in, in the Sermon on the Mount, the later parts of it, Matthew 5. He talks about, you have heard it said that you uh, do not commit murder. But I tell you. Verily, verily, I say to you, if you even think evil about a person, you have committed murder. Now, how can he say that? Moses didn't write that. He is speaking on the authority of God 
He's interpreting the very words of scripture, taking them where they need to go, giving us the correct understanding that the Father wants. Because why? He and the Father are one. He's the same God that had Moses write that back, back in the day. He's the one that can give us understanding and interpretation for our day. Well, I was reading somewhere for the weekend. What do you think that Jesus looks like? But it doesn't really matter. There's a sense that you feel. But people have, you know, have this image of him. But I don't think it really matters. Generally, the pictures that we have, uh, they're, they're a very European Jesus. He's, he's white. He's very handsome. Blonde hair, blue eyes. He, he, he would not look like that if you look at your average Jewish man. That's how he looks. How many of you were part of our uh, our uh, Life Life Bible study on, uh, what was it, Matthew? Do we do? I think it was the book of Matthew. And I, I showed you uh, clips from uh, the Gospel of Matthew, a, a, a movie yes. representation of that. Do you remember how Jesus looked? He looked like a Jew. Very Jewish, <laughs> large nose, curly black hair, very semantic, very Jewish features. That's more like how Jesus looked. I see some that uh, they'll, they'll do like a computer graph of how he looks and I, I guess it could be for your average, average Jew. Generally, they have him with long hair because the idea of a Nazarite. Um, if, if you were somebody who was devoted to God, who lived their lives for God alone, and, and you did things like avoided uh, certain foods and avoided drinking, um, that's how you live. Well, Jesus drank. <laughs> and he didn't have a problem with what he ate. But uh, that's kind of the idea of the Nazarite. Somebody who's dedicated to God and never cut their hair. And that's why he has long hair and a lot of pictures. But we don't know. We don't know that that was the case. He looks like Jeff Freed on the <laughs> and we're not going to care when we look at that. I mean, yeah. What are you going to look like? I don't know. I, I think, yeah, I I I think you're, you're going to look like you, but you're going to look like a more perfect and better example of you than you've ever been in this world because you're going to be perfect like God originally created you. Nobody really knows, but will you know people up there? I mean, yes. You will? I'll know you, and you'll know me. Okay. Uh, was just studying. We have at the end of Epiphany uh, is the Transfiguration account, and you remember the Transfiguration account. Who appears with Moses or with Jesus? Moses. Moses. How did they know? Yeah. How did Peter know who they were? Did they have their little tame? They, 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 <laughs> they just knew, even though they'd never seen them before. There was no photographs. There was no paintings. You're going to know who I am, and I'm going to know who you are. Same yeah, way. but know them. They, you know them that they were in your life, but you're not going to know them as like your that guy's my husband, right? You 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 have to take apart the the part of our relationship that is sexual. That will that won't be necessary. But the deep and abiding love you had for your husband, you're going to have that with everybody. Because all the things that stand in the way of that. Will you know then? What about the people that you know that aren't up there? Will you know that? I, if we have any idea of loved ones who didn't make it, who refused to believe, uh, we're going to so accept God's judgment of why they aren't there that we won't care. We won't. You won't be pining for them. about things up there. I hope You won't be pining for them. There'll be no worry. There'll be nothing no, to worry about. No. There'll be no sadness. There'll be no tears. I think you're going to be too happy with the people that are there. And you're going to be even happier because Christ is there in the flesh. You want to know how he looks? You'll get to see. All good questions. So we see God the Father and Jesus through mainly we said his miracles and his teaching, but how do we have those? We hold it by faith, but where do we get any idea that he did miraculous things and said miraculous things? Through scripture. So there's scripture come given to us for that very reason, so that we might know who he is and be able to trust and have faith in who he is.
Question four. And for this, it looks like we should probably turn back to Hebrews. So we'll turn back to Hebrews chapter one. Question four says an intimate relationship exists between the father and the son. The writer quotes the Old Testament twice in Hebrews 1, 5, and 13. 1, 5 says, for which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I've begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. In Hebrews 13, which says, and to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Uh, he quotes this to show that relationship, that intimate relationship between father and son. Which words show that Jesus is superior to angels and is God? So let's start with Hebrews 1.5. Oh, which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father? Or begotten. What is the creator God's relationship to angels? He created them. They're created beings. He created yeah. them. What's different about the son? He was begotten. Begotten when? Let's think about his divine Before nature. Before all worlds. Before all be eternity past, he's always been there, the begotten of the father. Of the same substance with the father. Okay, that's his divinity. How is Jesus begotten of the Father in his humanity? Mary's womb, who was his father? God. Holy Spirit. The, the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit overshadowing him. So in both his divinity and his humanity, he is begotten of the Father through the Holy Spirit. Angels were created. But not the son. The son was begotten, born in his humanity from the father, always existing in his divinity from the father. No angel can claim that, not even the devil. And then how about Hebrews 1.13? How does that show he's superior to the angels? Because if he, he was told to sit on the right hand, until you make your enemies a footstool for your feet. No. No angels sitting there ruling. No. Only Christ. And any enemy of angels is also an energy enemy of God. Angels don't really have enemies. Enemies are all of God. And there will come a day. You know what it means to have your enemies be your footstool? Uh, what, what do you place on a footstool? Your feet. Back in the day, when, when a king would conquer another king in another nation, they would bring that king before him. And if he didn't kill him, he would put his foot on that king's neck. What do you think the message was there? Yeah. I can crush you yeah. if I want by just pressing my foot on you. I have total control over your life and death and all that you own. And so what will happen when one day to have all the enemies of Christ? They'll be crushed. They'll be crushed. Not that their life will end it, but they'll be sent to eternal hell forever, and there's nothing they can do about it. There'll come a day when the demons, the devil, and even human beings that have fought against the church and refused to change will all be gone. And no longer trouble him anymore. And he will be declared equivocally what he is right now, without anybody to voice anything against him, the ruler of all things, and the creator of all things and the creator of all that is new on the last day. There's no angel that can claim that. Good. Question five. People generally worship superior, not inferior beings. Read Hebrews 1 verse six. Somebody want to do that? And again, he brings the firstborn into the world. He says, let all God's angels worship him. So we said, when did that happen? When did the angels worship Jesus? When they brought the firstborn into the world. When he was born? Mm -hmm. 
In fact, the angels got the shepherds rejoicing and worshiping Jesus, right? And that's because Jesus is superior. Did you ever see Jesus and anywhere in the accounts praising or worshiping angels? Not at all. We're asked to look at Revelation, a couple different chapters. So let's turn there. Keep your finger here in Hebrews. Let's turn to Revelation. First of all, let's go to Revelation chapter 5. And we're going to read verses 11 to 13. For those of you who don't know, Revelation is a, is a vision that John saw. And he's seeing things that are beyond his ability to communicate. He's seeing spiritual realities that don't exactly have a physical correspondent in our world that we could say this is what it's like. It's kind of like trying to describe the Grand Canyon to somebody who's never been there. Words fall short. John's words are falling short. He's trying to give you the best indication he can of things that are beyond this world. And so we're going to see a lot of symbolic things here. We'll talk about it. But read uh, Revelation 5 verses 11 to 13. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever who is the lamb that was slain christ jesus who died and rose again who we say still carries the marks of his crucifixion so that we remember and see them as signs of love. Who's worshiping him? Angels. angels. Who else besides angels? Elders. Mm -hmm. Who else? All the saints in heaven. Who else? Every creature in heaven. Every creature on heaven and on earth and under the earth and under the sea and all that is in them. In other words, everything. Everything that is created and existed is all worshiping. Christ, the risen Savior, the Lamb. On the last day, all things will worship him. Which means, what's his relationship to all things? Superior and worthy of worship. There's nothing greater than him. All things deserve and should worship Christ. What happens when things try to, when, when we or people or even John tries to worship something besides Christ, like angels? Turn to Revelation 22. And we'll read verses 8 through 9. Revelation chapter 22, verses 8 through 9. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and when I saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am to follow. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers and prophets. And with those who keep the words of this book, worship God. How do we know that Jesus is not an angel? The angel calls him God. If Jesus was an angel, should anybody have worshipped him? No. Mm -hmm. Did the disciples worship him? Yeah. 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 Before his resurrection and after his resurrection. Here we have all creatures worshiping Christ, worshiping God. If he was an angel, God the Father would have stopped that and said, no. It's got to be God if people are worshiping him. Questions, comments? This, by the way, is a good verse to use with uh, Jehovah Witnesses. You need to do some other building up because they'll deny it. They'll want to deny that Jesus is God. 
But if you can get them and you can't scripturally show them that he was worshipped and that he himself claimed to be God, then this verse flies in their face. If he's not God, why are the people worshipping him? And why is the Lord allowing it to happen? I thought the Jehovah Witnesses didn't necessarily have, they changed the Bible to suit their beliefs. Mm -hmm. So in their Bible, maybe it doesn't even have Christ saying that he is God. This is in there. This is in there? I, I mean, I don't work. know because I've never seen one. Yeah. I just... he, you know, uh, you have to you go back to the Old Testament and you have God saying that I am the first and the last. And then you go to Revelation and you have Jesus saying, I am the first and the last. And so what you argue with him is he's claiming to be Yahweh, or as they would call him, Jehovah. He's claiming to be God. And not only did he claim it, people worshipped him. And if he was an angel like they claim he was, or any kind of a firstborn of creation, he should never have been worshipped. It's not just us, the church, who they would find a rock that worshipped him. His followers. Do they believe in a savior? Jesus started it, but he didn't do enough because he's not God. They have to go and they have to make disciples. They have to go to people's house and knock on doors and get you baptized into their religion in order to be saved. That's how they earn their way to heaven because Christ couldn't earn it for them because he's not God. They would call him the savior, but he's not the savior in, in our respect. He's not, he's not, he, they have to do works to be saved. He started it, but you've got to finish it through works. Well, there's a lot of churches that believe that. Salvation Army people, that's what they yep. believe. They are. And we would call them heretical. I don't know that they don't believe in Christ as, as God, but they believe they, in getting to heaven by your good works. They insert works in. And if you do that, if you insert works in as part of salvation, you no longer have the gospel. The gospel is Christ did it all and you did nothing. That's the gospel. Add anything Christ but, any kind of but to it, and you really don't have the gospel and you really don't have salvation. Which is why we don't have altar and pulpit fellowship with the Salvation Army. Because what they confess and believe, we would have a huge problem with. That would be a Bible study for another time. Maybe sometime we can do a Bible study on world religions, but that's not for the Well, I've done it before, but you just, I guess you can't really get into it enough until you've actually. No. I don't know. It's, it's a very so pervasive many... belief because we want to do something. That's our nature. We want to be able to take responsibility. We want to have control. You've got no control over your salvation. Nothing. It's all Christ. It's all grace. It's all God. And the good works follow. Because of it. But they never earn us anything before God. Never. But like with Jehovah Witnesses, if they don't believe that God... I mean, because the Old Testament points to the fact that God is going to come and save us. He's going to send his son to save us. And if they don't believe that, then they don't even believe in the Old Testament. They have their own spin on the Old Testament. It's very confusing. It is because you know the truth from Scripture, and they don't. But there's people who are brought up Christian. You know, they might even be Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate. They convert mm -hmm. to Jehovah Witness. The idea that I can have control over my salvation is very pervasive. It's very attractive, but it's not true. And where does that all come from? Well, ultimately, it comes from Satan. He's got the silver tongue, a little bit of truth and a whole ton of lies. And he said, eons of experience in uh, confusing minds and working on convincing people to give up their faith. And it does happen. It usually happens from somebody that's not doing what you're doing, which is being faithful in Bible study, studying the scripture, receiving the sacraments, worshiping. That's how the Holy Spirit protects you. You take a break from worship, you take a break from Bible study, and your own sinful mind, which really, that whole idea of being able to earn your own salvation is really attractive, that can take over. Any other questions?
we could stop right here. We're at a good stopping point to pick up with uh, question six later on. Look into those verses. Does that work for you guys? Yeah. Um, Give you a little break. I mean, we've already. You see that? Why, why the? Three uh, minutes early. You see why the, the the introduction of this told you this is some heavy theology stuff. It, is. it might take us a few weeks to get through the sheet. But uh, <laughs> does does the way that this is presented does it help you to understand those heavy things? Mm -hmm. Yes. Any other comments or questions? Anything that you wanted to talk about or say or ask before we take a break for the day? Good study? Yes. Yes. Is your interest interest peaked? Good. Let's close with prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, who you are is beyond our understanding. And that can kind of scare us a little bit. That can leave us unsettled and unnerved. Yet it should be a comfort to us. That our creator God and the God who sustains all things and the God who came down to save us, the fact that you are beyond our understanding should be a comfort to us. There's nothing that's beyond your understanding. There's nothing that's beyond your ability. Therefore, you are more than able and willing and actually did come down, climb on the cross, die for our sins and rise again so that we can be forgiven and have eternal life. You are the only one that could do that and you accomplished it. Help us to continue to learn more about who you are, Jesus, and how you are the exact representation and reflection of the God that we designed to know but otherwise could not. Speak into our hearts, Holy Spirit. Help us to continue to wonder and marvel at what we've heard, and even more so, find ways in our lives to share your glory and who you are, not just for us, but for all mankind that you would call to believe in you through the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Joe, have a good day. See you later. Okay. I'll tell Pastor Hensley you all said hi. Oh, we're gonna do it. Yeah, get a car with her. <laughs>